So um, I'm going to have you go with me to Romans chapter 1, verses 1 through 7. <coughs> Excuse me. So we have covered so far, we talked about the divine side of the gospel in the introduction to Romans. We're going to talk about the human side of the gospel. And this is going to be part one of two. So you have six points in your notes. I'm only going to cover three of them. And in Romans chapter 1, verses 1 through 7, the word of our Lord, Paul, a bondservant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated to the gospel of God, which he promised before through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures concerning his son, Jesus Christ our Lord, who was born of the seed of David according to the flesh and declared to be the Son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. Through him we have received grace and apostleship for obedience to the faith among all nations for his name, among whom you also are the called of Jesus Christ. To all who are in Rome, beloved of God, called to be saints, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. So let us pray together. Father, we... Lord, come before you today and we pray for our brother up at Englewood Hospital, Lord. We pray for his wife, Gita, and all the kids. We pray, Lord God, for this man's healing. But, Lord, even more than that, we pray for his salvation. I pray, Lord God, I'm going to go up there and see him in the next uh, hour. I want to pray, Lord God, that your Holy Spirit would go with me, that you would prepare his heart to receive the gospel. And, Father God, I, I pray, Lord God, for this man's salvation, for your glory, for your honor. I pray, Lord God, a blessing upon this family. And I pray for his healing. And Lord God, I pray that you would open our hearts and minds to the word of God today. And that Lord God, you would speak to us through your word. Produce, Lord God, and plant a seed within us that would produce 30, 60, 100 times what is sown. And in this we pray in Jesus' name, amen. amen. Okay, so like I said, we, we have covered the divine side and we are now looking at the human side. I stress this, when you read the Word of God, always be looking because the Word of God will reveal to you who God is. It will reveal to you what God has done. And the Word of God will reveal who you are in Christ and what God has done for you. And you should be seeing that literally in every passage of Scripture from the book of the uh, Genesis to the book of Revelation. So when we come again to these seven verses today, we're going to look at the human side uh, of, uh, of the gospel. And um, we're going to uh, dig in to this. I'm going to focus with you on three key things today, and that is Paul, the bondservant of Christ, and called. And again, be looking here for a word from God, a rhema from God, that he would speak to your heart on, on these things. The first thing we'll look at is Paul, and it says in verse 1 that uh, Paul, a bondservant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated to the gospel of God. Now, we see Paul coming on the scene in the book of Acts, and uh, essentially we see him as Saul. He is Saul of Tarsus, a Pharisee. He described himself, really, I'll tell you, this is a, a passage, Paul was a super Jew. <laughs> I mean, he's a Jew on steroids. In Philippians chapter 3, verse 5 through 6, circumcised on the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, concerning the law of Pharisee, concerning zeal, persecuting the church, concerning the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. The problem is that cannot save you, and he knew that. It was only by the grace of God that he could be saved. He's born in, in Tarsus, which um, is up in that, that right-hand corner of the Mediterranean Sea. It's modern-day uh, Turkey today, not far from Antioch. And if you're coming up the coast of the Mediterranean, you would go up, and then you'd make that left-hand turn, and you, you'd end up in Tarsus. It was a Roman city, and Paul was a Roman citizen. In fact, if you know about the, the end of, of Paul and Peter, Peter was a Jew, and he was not a Roman citizen, and when Peter died, they crucified him. If you're a Roman citizen, you had the privilege of having your head cut off. Paul ends up with his head cut off, Peter ends up being crucified, and Peter didn't feel right to be crucified right side up as Jesus was, so he was crucified upside down. In Acts chapter 22, 3, uh, Paul again tells us, I am a Jew, born in Tarsus of Cilicia, that's a province of Rome, but brought up uh, in this city. I studied under Gamal and was thoroughly trained in the law of our ancestors, I was uh, just as zealous for God as any of you are today. It's interesting that here he talks about being basically tutored, mentored by Gamal. 
Gamaliel is the grandson of, uh, actually the great-grandson of Hillel in the Jewish uh, tradition in the time of Jesus. And if you really want to get into the deep study of the Word of God and understand what's happening in the Gospels and understand what's happening in the book of Acts and the Epistles, there were two schools of thought in, in the Jewish tradition. One was the school of Hillel. He was the conservative. So Gamaliel was a conservative. Paul was a conservative. And then you had the teaching of Shammai. Shammai is the liberal. Uh, one is orthodox, uh, the other is a, is a liberal uh, theology. You see the effect, really, that Hillel essentially had on the Pharisees and that Shammai had upon the Sadducees. The Sadducees, in their liberal theology, they denied the resurrection. They, they denied that the Bible was the word of God, all of it except for the Torah, the first, the first five books. Uh, they denied the existence of angels and even denied an afterlife. While the Pharisees did believe in, the, in those things, that what they added on a bunch of rules and regulations that are not uh, in the scriptures. But Paul, Paul again, Paul is this, Paul is this super Jew who is, is, is hell-bent on defending Judaism. So when the Christians come on the scene and they are saying that Jesus, Yeshua, is God, that's blasphemy. So he is hell-bent on destroying them. And what we see is we see him appearing on the scene in the stoning of Stephen. Stephen is one of the, the, the original seven deacons. Stephen is also this anointed preacher, a man of faith, a man of the spirit. And he's preaching the gospel uh, to the Jewish people. And uh, basically he's accusing them of basically dishonoring God while they're accusing him of blasphemy because he's proclaiming Jesus Christ as the Messiah and as God in the form of man. And Saul stands there and basically he is uh, commissioned them to stone Stephen. And while they're stoning Stephen... Uh, they're laying their coats at, at, Paul's, uh, at Saul's feet and, and honoring him. Now, Saul persecutes and he leads the persecution on the church. And what's interesting about Saul, and you think of this, as Saul, he caused the church to leave Jerusalem and spread into the world. By the way, what did Jesus say? Jesus said, you shall be witnesses when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. Right? You're going to go out. And you're going to leave Jerusalem. You're going to go to Judah. You're going to go to Samaria. You're going to go to the ends of the earth. And you're going to preach the gospel. But you get all the way to Acts chapter 8 and the church is still huddled together in Jerusalem and they haven't done what Jesus called them to do, to go out and preach to the whole world. So God uses Saul, this Pharisee, to spread the church before he ever became Paul, the apostle to the Gentiles. And you see this in Acts chapter 8 verses 1 through 4. Look at this. Now Saul was uh, consenting to his death, consenting to the death of Stephen, which occurs in Acts chapter 7. And at that time a great persecution arose against the church which was at Jerusalem, and they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. And devout men carried Stephen to his burial and great, made great lamentation over him. As for Saul, he made havoc of the church, entering every house and dragging off men and women and committing them to prison. Therefore, those who were scattered went everywhere preaching the word. So before he was ever a Christian, God used him to spread the gospel. Now he goes up to Damascus, he's got letters from the Sanhedrin, the, the, the leaders of, of the Jewish faith in Jerusalem, and he's on his way up to Damascus riding on his high horse, and the Lord knocks him off his high horse to the ground. And uh, Jesus shines in front of him in all of his glory, and uh, it tells us in, in verse uh, 4 and 6, of Acts chapter 9, then he fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, who are you, Lord? And then the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. He said, it is hard for you to kick against the goads. You know what a goad is? That's a goad. You use that, you use that to prod cattle. Imagine kicking against that. It's not going to be too long. You're going to be missing your toes, probably missing your whole foot. Why are you kicking? You're fighting against me, Saul. When people oppose the gospel, and maybe they're doing it for religious reasons, and it might be uh, militant, uh, you know, Islam, it might be ISIS or, or one of the uh, uh, different groups, Al-Qaeda or one of the other groups, or it might be somebody who's, who's a, an Orthodox Jew who's fighting against the faith. It might even be some heretic, uh, you know, person in the, in the Christian church fighting against the faith. They're fighting against God, and eventually they're going to break themselves and destroy themselves as they fight against God. So he, trembling and astonished, said, Lord... What do you want me to do? That's a surrender to Jesus. So Jesus sends him to Damascus. And in Damascus, he sends a guy named Ananias to him. 
Let me tell you something. Ananias is one of the most heroic people you'll find in Scripture. Saul is, is, is killing Christians. He's persecuting the church. And the Holy Spirit says to Ananias, I want you to go to Saul. He's mine now, Lord. He came up here to kill me. And then Ananias, in his, in his courage, goes to Paul. Paul is blinded. He's got these, uh, this blindness in his eyes. Ananias uh, prays for him, spends time with him. The scales fall from his eyes. He sees, and then he is baptized. And he's baptized into Christ Jesus. And the rest, we would say, is history. You read about it in the book of Acts. He becomes this force for God. Now, I wanted to share with you a couple of thoughts about Paul, and there are so many thoughts. I mean, you could stay here and you could share about Paul all day. But here's a couple of things. Paul was anointed. And I'll say this. It was, I believe, the greatest anointing that has ever fallen upon a Christian in history. I mean, he, he is a man so filled and clothed with the Spirit of God. He is a, a spiritual force. He is uh, filled with the power of God. He works miracles of healing people, raising the dead, preaching and teaching. And his letters are so saturated and anointed with God. Paul was brilliant. You talked about a... a, a, a sanctified mind. He is brilliant in logic, in reasoning, in intellect. He writes one-third of the New Testament. At the end of the 20th century, a group of scholars got together and said, let us select the six greatest minds in the last 2,000 years. Paul was one of the six. He, he was a man of, of incredible brilliance. When you read the letters and you see that brilliance of how the Spirit worked through his intellect to write the things that he wrote. Paul was fearless. He had the heart of a lion. He feared no man. He feared no demon. He feared not death. He only feared one thing and one person, and that was the Lord. And he stood firm against the Jewish leaders. He stood firm against the Christian leaders in Jerusalem. He even stood firm against Peter in Galatians chapter 2 and opposed Peter for his compromise. He stood firm against Rome. He stood firm against procurators, Caesars, and all the pagan occult religions and religious leaders. He was as bold as a lion. He was tenacious. He was brave. He was heroic 24-7, 360 Hebrew days of the year. Saul was tough. If he was a football player, his name would have been Buckus. If he was a baseball player, his name would have been Jackie Robinson. And if he was a boxer, his name would have been Rocky. He was tough, he was resilient, and he was strong. And he didn't know the word quit. It, it didn't exist in his mind and it didn't exist in his vocabulary. There was no giving up. There was only one way and that was forward. Look at Paul in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 24 through 29. From the Jews, five times I received 40 stripes minus one. That would take the flesh, the skin off your back. Many times it would take the muscles off your back or totally serrate them. Many times you would see the organs actually exposed through the shredded skin and shredded muscles. And this happened to him five times. Most of us, you know, we get a little scratch on our car and we're depressed for a week. We have these little setbacks and we can't handle it to be able to press on with the work of God. I've seen Christians, people in the church, they quit, quit, over, quit over the most ridiculous things. He says, three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Uh, just, to, just to give you commentary, he's not talking about smoking weed, okay? You understand, you're stoned with rocks, like Stephen. <laughs> three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day I have been uh, in the deep. In journeys often, in perils of water, in perils of robbers, in perils of my own countrymen, in perils of the Gentiles, in perils of the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils of the sea, in perils among false brethren, in weariness and toil and sleeplessness, often in hunger and thirst, in fasting often, in cold and nakedness, besides the other things, what comes upon me daily, my deep concern for all the churches, who is weak, and I am not weak, who is made to stumble, and I do not burn with indignation. I mean, you, t you talk about a man who is tough. I, I have never come across anybody in any literature, anybody in history, who was as tough as the Apostle Paul. 
Now we you know, worship athletes and we worship um, octagon fighters and we worship boxers. You know, we worship all these different people. I, I've never come across anyone as tough as Paul. He had, he had a, an unconquerable spirit. He was un, un, unbeatable. And Paul was a man of love. He was infused with the agape love of the Lord, that, that, that agape love energy of the Messiah that is spoken about in Colossians chapter 1. He, he talked about how it just infused his life. And he gives a description of, of love in probably one of the greatest, right, the greatest passages of Scripture. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, 4 through 7. I mean, everybody reads it. At every wedding they read this. But if you really look at it, it's truly an amazing picture of agape love that lived in the heart of Paul. Love suffers long. In other words, it don't quit. And it's kind. Love does not envy. It does not uh, parade itself. It is not puffed up. It does not behave rudely. It does not seek its own. It is uh, not provoked. Thinks no evil. Does not rejoice in inequity, but rejoices in truth. Bears all things. Believes all things. Hopes all things. Endures all things. The love, the love of God was in the heart of Paul and that's what drove him. That's what drove him on and on and on against challenge after challenge, problem after problem, adversity after adversity. He was constantly driven on by this, by this love in his heart to save people. To, to, to have people hear the gospel of Jesus Christ that some would be saved, some would be snatched from the flames. I want to I read this to you. This is a letter... Somebody put this together and I found it very profound. It's a letter to my friend and it's written by a person who's in hell. I think, I think it, would, it would describe what, what, what motivated Paul. It says, My friend, I stand in judgment now and feel that you are to blame somehow. On earth I walked with you day by day and never did you point the way. You knew the Lord in truth and glory but never did you tell the story. My knowledge then was very dim. You could have led me safe to him. Though we lived together on earth, you never told me of the second birth. And now I stand this day condemned because you failed to mention him. Paul never failed to mention him to anyone. You taught me many things, that's true. I called you friend and trusted you, but I learn now that it's too late. You could have kept me from this fate. We walked by day and talked by night, and yet you showed me not the light. You let me live and love and die. You knew I'd never live on high. Yes, I called you a friend in life and trusted you through joy and strife, and yet on coming to this end, I cannot now call you my friend. It's convicting, right? How many people are in your lives who are going to hell and you've never told about Jesus Christ? You've never, you've never confronted them with the gospel. How many people in your families, brothers, sisters, mothers, fathers, who you've never spoken to about the gospel of Jesus Christ? Do you really love them? Or are you in so in love with yourself and your insecurities and, 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 that, that you're, you're afraid to share the gospel with them? See, Paul, Paul, Paul was never overcome by those. He never, he never cared what people thought about him. He loved them too much to be concerned whether they approved of, of the gospel or not. And that love drove him. It drove him right to the end. Until the end, he could write, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. And under Nero, the tradition says, they took Paul out. And he laid his head down upon that stump. You ever wonder what he was thinking there? I've seen the movie a number of times, and I watched it again, a movie the other night that showed that. What's going through his mind? He's going to be with the Lord in just a second. To live is Christ and to die is gain. Uh, Paul wrote in Romans chapter 35, 39, Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? As it is written, for your sake we are killed all day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. Yet in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. In two places Paul says to the church, follow me, imitate me. In 
1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 1 and Philippians 3, he says, follow me, imitate me. I don't know who your role models are. <laughs> and when I look at the world, I, I, I was watching something last night. I just happened to flip on a channel of, it was a guy being inducted into the uh, NFL Hall of Fame. And the people were like, it looked like, it looked like a worship service. They were like standing there with their hands open, like, like worshiping this guy. I was just like, I thought it was a worship service. But I don't know who your role models are, and we're not to worship Paul. But let me tell you, he's a heck of an example. And when I look at Paul and the life he lives, I'll tell you where it drives me. It drives me to my knees, and I say, Lord, help me. <laughs> I believe as Paul looked to Jesus, he was driven the same place on his knees. He said, Lord, I'm not going to be able to ever follow you, ever be able to imitate you unless you give me your grace and your love. But when, when I look, when I look at, at, at Paul, I'm, I'm driven to my knees all the time saying, help me, Lord. All right, let's look at point number two. A bondservant of Jesus Christ. So in verse 1-1, one, one, Paul, a bondservant of Jesus Christ. And if you look at the Greek word there, and it's an important word to learn, it's doulos, bondservant. And it essentially comes from Exodus chapter 21, verses 1-6, through six, and Deuteronomy chapter 15. So it means slave. I just want to give you a little, a little background on Hebrew slaves. A Hebrew slave was essentially an indentured servant. A Hebrew slave was somebody who essentially, they either committed a crime and they paid off that crime in a seven-year sentence serving someone, or it was somebody who just volunteered to be a servant, or somebody who was poor wasn't able to make it, and then they volunteered to be a servant and they would have a house to live in, they would have food to eat as they served uh, the master of the house. So understand, the big difference of, of slavery in the Hebrew culture, when the Bible has come under fire for slavery, it's very different than what we saw in American history and what we see around the world right now. And again, I say to you, there are more slaves today than there were 100 years ago in, in the world. There are 27 million slaves in the world. Most of them are women and children. So it comes from, from Deuteronomy chapter 15. And what's beautiful about this, when the person was placed into this service, they, they were always... Essentially, they belonged to God. They didn't belong to the person. They weren't their property. And essentially, they belonged to the community. And there were laws, as you read the Old Testament, to protect them. They weren't allowed to be beaten and abused. So you see in Exodus chapter 21, verses 5 through 6, at the end of the seven-year period, the Shemata, okay, they would come to a point where the person would be set free. You served your seven years, you paid your debt, and now you're free to go. But if the servant, as it says here in verse 5, plainly says, I love my master. Um, he's given me a wife. He's given me children. Uh, I will not go free. So he's in love. He loves his master. He says, then his master shall bring him to the judges. And he shall also bring him to the door or the doorpost. And his master shall pierce his ear when they're all. And he shall serve him forever. So he says, I love my master so much. He's been so good to me. He's given me a house. He's given me prosperity. He's given me abundance. I've got food to eat. I've got family. I want to serve him the rest of my life. So I've understood that. I've taught this for years, that we, we are called to be bond servants of the Lord. And it, it is out of love that we serve the Lord. And if you're having a problem serving the Lord and being a bondservant to him, it is likely that you really haven't come to understand his love. You haven't really bathed yourself in his love. You haven't experienced his love. And you haven't grasped on to what he did for you on that cross six hours that Friday and what he's done for you ever since. So the person who's struggling to obey God and live for God and to be his slave has a problem understanding the love of God. And they need to come into a place where the Holy Spirit begins to reveal that love to them on a daily basis. And they begin to bathe in it and saturate themselves in it. So I understood that. But and then I look at this and I, I, I say, why a door? Right, you take them out to a door, a doorpost. Why a piercing? And why an ear? And I always believe that the scriptures, the scriptures, you, you need to dig deep to really grasp onto the truths of scripture. You know that about this place. If you came here to get a sermon eight, you came to the wrong place. If you came to get a self-help message, you came to the wrong place. 
I believe in teaching the Word of God and digging into the Word of God. So I began to dig. I began to dig into the Word of God here. Did you ever wonder, though, that why a door, why a piercing, and why an ear? Because I do believe that every chapter in the Tanakh, in the Old Testament, reveals Yeshua to us. Every chapter. So is Yeshua in this? Yeshua in, in Matthew chapter 20, 28, he said, Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life for ransom for many. Who is the perfect doulos? Who is the perfect bondservant? Jesus is the Father's doulos. So why a door? Because he is the door. Start to look a little deep and you start to see him in this. In John chapter 10 verse 9, in fact he says it twice in the scriptures, I am the door. He's the threshold to the Father. He's the door by which we have to enter through. In, in, in John chapter 14, 6, I'm the way, the truth, and the life, and no one come to the Father except through me. There's no other way. There's no other door. Sorry. Muhammad's not a door. Buddha's not a door. Sorry. Man will make up his religions. He'll create all his imaginary doors. People do it individually. They create their own imaginary doors, works doors, religious doors. He's the door. Why piercing? Because he was pierced. Five holes. We were just talking about it in the membership meeting upstairs. Five holes, by the way, that you will still see upon him when you meet him. Just as the apostles saw the holes in his hands and the holes in his feet and the hole in his side. Remember Thomas? I won't believe unless I see the holes. Jesus said, here I am, Thomas. Here they are. Stick your hand in them. And in Revelation chapter 5, I saw a lamb as though he had been slain. He is the slain lamb. So a hole in his right hand, a hole in his left hand, a hole in his right foot, a hole in his left foot, and a hole in his side. Five holes. He is pierced. And why the right ear? And we start to look at the scriptures and you see in the book of Leviticus that the high priest... Moses would anoint his brother Aaron and he would place blood upon his right ear lobe. Who is Jesus? Our what? Hebrews, our high priest, who makes intercession for us day and night. He stands between us and the Father and he makes intercession for us. He is the high priest. I often wonder, and maybe this is going a little further than I should, but that crown of thorns, I wonder if there was a thorn pierced right through his right ear. I may have to ask him that when I see him. But he is the perfect doulos. The definition, one who gives himself up for another, another's will, one whose service is used by Christ in extending and advancing his cause among men. The prayer of a doulos is not my will but yours be done. It is, it is submission and surrender and yielding oneself to him, it is, it is giving up your agenda and beginning to live and abide by his agenda. It is seeking his will in the decisions you make, the choices you make in your homes, in your careers, in your, in your morality, in your ethics, in your sexuality. It is seeking his will and not yours. That's a doulos. And we are all called to be doulos. You know what I believe is? If you're in the church and you have not surrendered to being his doulos, I can guarantee you're having some misery in your walk. I guarantee that. You're sitting here right now, you, you've got some misery in your walk. When, when you hear about that, that, that joy that transcends all understanding, that, that peace that transcends all understanding, you're not experiencing that. Uh, the final point I'll make today is called. So in verse 7, Paul, a bondservant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated to the gospel of God. And then if you look at, at verse 7, it says, to all who are in Rome, beloved of God, called to be saints. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. So here Paul specifically says, I, I'm called to be an apostle. And that's unique to Paul. An apostle was somebody who had to have been with Jesus and essentially somebody who had to have seen Jesus and obviously Paul saw Jesus on the road to Damascus. A lot of people call themselves apostles today. 
if they're living by the criteria of Scripture, uh, I believe they're false apostles. Because unless they were with him and they've seen him, now I believe there could be a, 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 there's a gift, an apostolic gift of planting churches. That's what essentially the apostles were. They were leaders of the church. They were planters of churches, but really in a true apostolic sense of what you see in the scriptures, um, there, there were 12 of them. Paul's the 13th. And there are actually a few others who are mentioned in Scripture. But he was an apostle. But notice verse 7. To all who are in Rome, beloved of God, called to be saints. We all share in that calling. Now God may call you to specific things, specific ministries. He's called me to be a pastor teacher. That's one of the fivefold gifts in Ephesians chapter 5. But, but called to be saints. We're all called to be saints. If you come from a Roman Catholic background, you know that when you saw this in the scriptures, it called your brain to scramble a little bit because I was raised Roman Catholic and the idea of a saint, a saint was somebody who the Pope or a prominent bishop canonized. And the idea that, that we're, we're all saints. Look at, look at the difference between biblical theology and Roman Catholic theology. The Roman Catholic understanding of saints compared with the biblical teaching. In Roman Catholic theology, the saints are in heaven. In the Bible, the saints are on earth and in heaven. In Roman Catholic teaching, a person does not become a saint unless he, she, is beatified or canonized by the Pope or a prominent bishop. In the Bible, everyone who has received Jesus Christ by faith is a saint. In Roman Catholic practice, the saints are revered, prayed to, and in some instances worshipped. In the Bible, saints are called to revere, worship, and pray to God alone. And that's, that's a huge difference. That's why when, when I was raised as a Catholic, when I became a Christian, and I went to, I left Catholic Church as a kid, became an atheist, then when I became born again, I said, I have to go to church. And I was going to go back to the Catholic Church. It's the only church I knew. I thought that old churches like this, you're all crazy. <laughs> I thought the Catholics were crazy too, but I thought that you guys were really crazy. And um, I thank the Lord. Because you know what he did? He did with me like he did with Paul. He kept Paul for three years. Taught him. And the Lord kept me for about six months before I started going to church. And all I did was read the word. I read the word and prayed and shared the gospel with everybody I met. My family would run from me when I go to the house. They would run. Everyone but my mother. God bless a mother, right? A mother's love. There's nothing like a mother's love. My father would run upstairs. My brother would run upstairs. My sister would run out the back door. In time, each one of them received Christ, except for my brother. Not yet. I still pray for him every day. When I fitness center, I used to run a, a fitness center. I was frequently in the, uh, in the weight training room. I used to love the weight training room. And I was in there, and, and we used to have what we call a Nautilus circuit, where you'd people, put people on 12 exercise machines, keep them on there for about a minute and a half, take them off 30 seconds, put them on another machine, you'd strap them in. i get them from the first machine by the last machine. When we got to the last machine, I'm praying the sinner's prayer with them. I'm serious, I did that with a number of people. I used to run Bible studies on the uh, racquetball court. I had about 50 kids. In fact, some people who come to this church, kids who are grown up now and have kids, came out of that, that study. I just had a guy, James, who, who was, we led to the Lord in one of those groups back, uh, back when he was in high school. But I, I was going to go back to the Roman Catholic Church, and as I got indoctrinated in the scriptures, I saw, see, the Roman Catholic Church believes tradition and the Bible are on the same plane. And I began to see, if that's true, then there are contradictions because the Bible is contradicting the Catholic Church. Catholic Church contradicting the Bible. And here's one of the issues. The Bible teaches that we're all saints. If you are born again, if you're in Christ, you're a saint. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 1. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God, to the saints who are at Ephesus and who are faithful in Christ Jesus. In Philippians 1.1, 1, 1, Paul and Timothy, bondservants of Jesus Christ, to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are in Philippi, including the overseers and deacons. And 2 Corinthians 1.1, 1, 1, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother, to the church of God which is at Corinth with all the saints who are throughout Achaia. Now, I want to just tell you this. I can understand Ephesus and Philippi, but Paul says that the Corinthians were saints too. And if you know anything about the Corinthians, they're a bunch of maniacs. And he even says they're saints. And that gives hope for us all, right? <laughs> I mean, they, they were, they, I mean, the pastor of that church had no hair and he lost it very quick because he pulled it out. 
divisions, arguing, carnality, I mean, drunkenness. I mean, it was, uh, the Lord's Supper was a drunken feast. And the rich people were eating all the food and the poor people were left, being left outside. I mean, they really made a mess of the church. But he calls them saints. Now, I want to show you something here. Being saints, there is first what we call positional saints in Christ. It, it is our position in Christ. In 1 Corinthians chapter 14, 33, it says, For God is not the God of confusion, but of peace, as in all the churches of the saints. If you are in Christ, you are positionally a saint. What does that mean? If you're in Christ, God has declared you to be righteous. If you're in Christ, God has declared you to be justified of all your sins. He, he has washed away your sins by his righteous act on the cross and by his blood. He has, he has accredited, he has accredited to you and given you his very righteousness. So in a legal positional stance, we are saints and declared righteous. If you look at um, 2 Corinthians 5.21, for he, God, made him, Jesus, who knew no sin, to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. If you struggle with sin, try this. Just start declaring when the devil comes and tempts you. Just say, I am the righteousness of God in Jesus Christ. Try it. Start to say it with confidence. Say it with passion. I am the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Some of you might, may be sitting there and saying, but I'm uncomfortable saying that. Positionally, that's where you are. Positionally, that's who you are. When God looks at you, He looks at you in His Son Jesus, and He doesn't see your sins. He sees the righteousness of the Lord. Try it. You know what happens when you do this? You're struggling with some sin. You've fallen short in some area. Just start saying this, saying this. And what will happen is, I believe, give it time and it will become something that it becomes an experience in your life. You'll find yourself struggling with that sin less and less and less. I'm telling you, it's, it, it's an amazing... I shared this with, with a brother that I, that I talk to every week who was struggling with a sin and it had a profound effect. And after a month, he says to me, God has delivered me of that sin. Now that's again, that, that is a positional stance. There is also a practical stance as saints. And that we should be practicing our sainthood. So Ephesians 5.3, But immorality or any impurity or greed must not even be named among you as is proper among saints. So we, we should be resisting the devil... We need to be doing battle, resisting the flesh. That lower nature, you know that lower nature that we all have, that it's there. It could be that, that, that anger, it could be that, that selfishness, it could be that greed, it could, it could be lust. It's there. And until we are, we, we are glorified, it's going to still be there. And what will happen when we're glorified, we'll be delivered from the flesh. But the flesh is still there and we have to do battle with it. The flesh lusteth against the spirit and the spirit against the, uh, the flesh. So we need, we need to resist. We need to resist the flesh and yield ourselves and give ourselves to the spirit. So we battle. We battle every day as saints. And it is God who works in us and he energizes us. That was my word from the Lord this week. God gives us a word. Colossians 1, Paul says, and it is Christ who is energizing me. I realize it's not me. It, it's not me to, to have the energy and strength for the fight. It's him giving me the energy. Before I was a Christian, when I was tempted, I just would roll over. Right? You just roll over. I didn't even, I didn't even think it was sin. Get a little conviction every once in a while from the Holy Spirit, but really, really didn't. I just roll over, right? It's, you know, I say... If you've ever done uh, jujitsu, you've done some type of uh, ground, uh, you know, ground fighting, submission wrestling. We have a lot of people here who do that in the church. You know this. You people tap out, right? If somebody gets you in an arm bar, they get you in a, a chokehold, they get you in a triangle, you tap out. I used to just tap out without a resistance. Once I came to Christ, I began to resist. Began to look for ways to get out. God always gives you a doorway out. Resist the devil and he'll flee from you. So we, we work out, we work out our sainthood by seeking to yield to him, 
seeking for him to conform us each day and make us more and more like his son. That is his ultimate goal in your life, to make you more and more and more like Jesus. Romans chapter 8, verse 29, to conform you to the image of his son. And as we yield to him, he is able to do that. So when you, when you understand again this, this, this picture here, the position and the practical, right? We are saints. And that is your identity. I want you to understand it's your identity in Christ. Do you know that, that the way you see yourself, the identity that, that you have, your self-image, and this is where modern day psychology catch, captures up with the Bible, your self-image is going to determine the way you think. It's going to determine your emotions. It's going to determine your actions. I believe to a great extent it's going to determine your success in life. But the way you see yourself. Think of this. Where in the New Testament are we ever called sinners? Anyone? Where are we called sinners? You know, Paul calls himself the chief sinner. And I understand, I understand that very real, in a practical sense. I, I understand I fall short of the glory of God. But nowhere in the New Testament do you see the Holy Spirit ever calling a Christian a sinner. We are called saints. We are called the light of the world, the salt of the earth. We are called ambassadors of Christ. We are called children of God. We are called sons of God. By the way, women, if you have a problem with not being called a daughter of God, the reason you're called a son of God is because the son had all the privileges. So you might be a daughter of God, but as a son of God, you got all the privileges and you got the inheritance coming to you. And that's why is that you, you have sons used. It's not, it's not something negative against women. Women are sons of God just as the men are sons of God. You have all the inheritance and all the privileges that a man has. We are even called kings. Revelation chapter 1, 6. We are called priests. We are called the redeemed. And when that becomes our identity, when we really start to identify as being saints, you're going to find that, that again, you're going to behave different, you're going to talk different, you're going to act different. And you look at a person in the church who is acting like the world, I guarantee they haven't come to that place where they are identifying and that self-image, that self-concept has, has truly been forged in Christ and who they truly are. Now the devil, the devil in the world is going to come to you and he's going to tell you, they're going to tell you you're everything, you're everything that, the Bible is, you know, that, that, that the Bible is saying that you're, you know, that, that you're, that you're not. They're going to come and they're, they're, going to, they're going to make all kinds of accuse, accusations to you. They're going to tell you, you, you know, you're this and you're that. And they're going to try to get you to identify with any sin or maybe any sin struggle you have. But the Holy Spirit's going to be speaking to you consistently and he's going to be trying to forge in you that identity that the Lord has given you. When you, when you start to really grasp on to that identity in Christ, let me tell you something. That, that is incredibly powerful. Because you will start to think different. You will start to feel different. You will start to act different. You will start to behave different. You're going to see your, your life will become a force instead of a farce when you become deeply rooted in your identity as a saint. It's an incredibly powerful thing. So not only, not only is Paul called, we are all called. And if you're in Christ, that is your identity as a holy one of God. You've been set apart for the Lord. And that's a beautiful thing. So here, here's, our, here's our application today. So I focus again on, on, four, uh, on three things, and then next week we'll focus on the others. Paul, a, a bondservant of Christ, and called, and I want to apply this for a second. And then next week we're going to look at grace, beloved of God, and peace. So the first here is, is Paul. I believe that the deeper you get into the Word, the deeper your love and appreciation will grow for Paul. Man, I, I want to hang out with Paul when I get to heaven. I, I want to spend time with him. What, you know, just what a great example. What a great example to follow. What, what a true, authentic Christian and again, when we look at his life, it's something that, that drives me to my knees and I say, Lord, help me. <laughs> Fill me. Change me. Transform me. 
I think Paul again had that experience as he was following, following Yeshua. But what an example that we have in Paul. Second, bondservant. It's a surrender of love. Have you spent time kneeling at the cross? Not that cross where it just... In your time with the Lord, have you spent time... It should be a daily time that you have where you just spend time with Him, communing with Him, adoring with Him, confessing to Him, praising Him, thanking Him. And have you seen that those nails in His hands were meant for you and me? The nails in His feet, the piercing of His side. Have you... Have you seen that that separation that occurred between he and the Father on the cross when he said, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And let me tell you, the physical pain was horrible. The emotional pain was horrible. But the spiritual pain, and we can't fully wrap our minds around how the Father is separated from the Son. Somehow Jesus and his humanity was separated from the Father on that cross. And he suffered hell. Because that's what hell is. Hell is separation from God. Complete 100% separation from God. And he experienced that separation on the cross. And when you begin to grasp onto that, I think you're going to find that, that your love is going to grow and the desire to be his servant, the desire to be his doulos, his bondservant, that's going to increase and you're going to find yourself, you're going to find yourself seeking to do his will in your life. And then last, called to be a saint. Every one of you, called to be a saint, chosen in Christ. And he has called us to be his separated ones, his holy ones. The hagios of Yeshua. And the more you identify with who God is, has made you who he has called you to be, the actual identity he's given you. The more you identify with that, the stronger and the greater your life will become in Christ. I think it's, it's, it's a matter of truly receiving. You know, really, really conceiving it, receiving it, believing it. And it's incredibly powerful. And, and that ultimate realization of us being saints, when we are glorified, do you know when we are glorified, we'll be greater than the angels? You know, this, this whole cosmic battle that's been going on that you see from the book of Genesis to the book of Revelation, this battle between the Lord and his fallen angel Lucifer and one-third of the angels that fell. And there's, there's something that God is doing here in creating many sons, many sons, who are going to be brought into glory. I think one day there are going to be a multitude from every tribe and nation and language and they will love the Lord. And they will love the Lord 100% purely. And I think the Lord will look at Satan and say, Look, I would have given you all of this, but you rebelled against me. Mm. <laughs> the lake of fire that you go to. But we will be greater. We will be greater than the angels. And that's an incredible thing. He's given us a little taste of that now. Hey, if you're not a Christian, if you haven't given your life to Jesus Christ, you have the opportunity to do that this morning. You have the opportunity to open your heart and ask Jesus to come into your heart to be your Lord and Savior, to put your faith in him that he died on the cross for you and was raised from the dead and received complete forgiveness and pardon of all your sins. There's no offer that you will ever be made that's as great as that. And I stress this to you. The Lord may be passing right through your life this morning. I stress this. Don't think you may have a second chance. You may not. The heart can grow incredibly hard very quickly. If the Lord is passing through your life this morning, I don't care if you're old or you're young, if you have not asked Jesus to come into your heart, do that this morning. Make him your Lord and Savior. Open the door and invite him in.
wonderful. He's our counselor, right? He's the mighty God. Gracious. Let's exalt him together.
day. 